Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, you're back on Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm honored to have with me today Ralph Cosa, president of Pacific Forum. So nice to have you, Ralph. Thanks, Jay. Nice to be here. It's great. We spent uh, many times here, and uh, we've talked uh, a lot over the years, and uh, I've, I've observed and participated to some extent in your programs, and I read your PACnets, and I'm so delighted to be associated with you and with Pacific Forum. Well, yeah. we're delighted to meet with you as well. This is a great community service. Let's talk about Wednesday, Wednesday, March 21st, right. coming very soon. You have a big program. It's your annual Board of Governors meeting at the Sheraton. Can you talk about it? Yeah, it's uh, Wednesday night. Uh, 7 o'clock is the dinner, 6.30 reception. Uh, this year will be special because it's a tribute to Joe Vasey, our founder, who passed away a couple of weeks ago at the age of 101. Oh, wow. Uh, and, we should all live so long. Uh, that's right. We should be so lucky. And uh, he's a great American. and. A great contribution to society, to Hawaii, to the world. Uh, so we'll be paying tribute to him. Uh, and our featured speaker uh, will be Rich Armitage, who yeah. is a former Deputy Secretary of State, uh, who pulls no punches, lets you know exactly what he thinks, uh, and has a wealth of uh, knowledge on the Asia Pacific region. Yeah, I've seen him before at, Pacific, yeah. at the Board of Governors. Rich has been with uh, us previously. Yeah. So unpacking that a little bit, Joe Vasey, can yeah. you talk about his life and times and his role uh, in the military, in the Navy here in Hawaii? Yeah, well, Joe was a submariner in World War II. His, his skipper was a commander named Jack McCain. Uh, his last job... You know the, that name. <laughs> that's right. His last job in the military was the uh, chief of plans and strategy at Pacific Command under Admiral John McCain. Mm -hmm. So uh, he and McCain go back a long way. He's, of course, the senator's father. Uh, he's very close with the senator. Uh, but when Joe was in World War II, uh, he was in a submarine, uh, and they were being depth charged by Japanese destroyers. And he said, if I live through this, we're going to find a better way to solve problems other than people dropping bombs on one another. And he remembered that pledge, and in 1975, when he retired uh, after a very illustrious c career, uh, he was even military aide to Harry Truman at one point in his oh, career. Yeah. Uh, he founded the Pacific Forum to find a better way of d handling disputes, and we've been following that vision ever since. Yeah, it was visionary. He was also active here in the Vietnam War, wasn't he? Well, yeah, I mean, he had been active. Uh, he was the, the J-5 with Admiral McCain as the commander while they were planning missions to drop bombs on Vietnam when McCain's son was a prisoner of war in one of those yeah. prison camps. So uh, he was very much involved in, in the Vietnam War prosecution uh, uh, as well. Yeah. And, and um, uh, you were in the service, too. You were in the Air Force, as I remember? I, I was. And uh, did you know him at that time? Uh, I actually, as a young captain, got to brief Admiral McCain and, and Admiral Vasey. Uh, they sure didn't remember it. I wasn't, I wasn't that memorable as a captain, but uh, <laughs> it sure had a big impact on me. Oh, sure. I was in the Coast Guard at the time. John McCain was, uh, what did they sink pack yeah. back when at yeah. Makalapa? Yeah. And uh, I met him a couple of times when I was here then, just to show you my age, Ralph. Yeah, no, <laughs> fa fascinating character, a fascinating character with a big cigar. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Was, he, was, he was the statement of the Navy at the yeah, time. Absolutely. It was very important. Absolutely. Okay, so, uh, see, Joe Vasey was a huge figure. He was a huge yeah. figure in the, in, in more than just the military, he was a huge figure in, uh, in, in, in the study of diplomacy uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, and he was known among all the people who support Pacific Forum um, as the founder, as the leader, right. and they come, they have come over the years to see him in large part. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, we had a memorial service for him today at Arcadia, mm -hmm. and uh, I told a story that back in the 1980s, uh, Joe tried to round up support and interest. He had this Chinese mayor coming uh, to Honolulu, and uh, he went around trying to get people signed up, and they all said, China? A bunch of communists there, they'll never amount to anything. Why waste your time talking about to the Chinese? Uh, that Chinese was Zhu Rongji, who turned out to be the premier of China and the architect of their legitimate great leap forward under Jiang Zemin. Uh, so Joe was there way ahead of, of the crowd, uh, trying to open doors with the Chinese and, uh, and bringing them aboard. Uh, but he also pulled no punches about China and wrote a lot of very interesting pieces that uh, talked about China's rise and what we needed to do to deal with it. Yeah, people don't realize that um, 
intelligence officers, senior officers, operational officers in the, in the military get to be very expert Absolutely. about diplomatic relations. Yeah. Uh, and they are authorities, and this, that's uh, the case uh, with Joe Vasey. It's the case with you yeah. here in the Pacific. So much has happened. You've studied it for so many years. You are exquisitely familiar with it. And I, you know, I don't. The public should appreciate. You should appreciate yeah. what happens yeah, at Pacific that's, Forum. That's right. Root, root for Pacific <laughs> Forum. We're we're here to help. We have an overactive Mother Teresa gene. You know, we're actually trying to make the world a better place and uh, trying to get people to talk with, to one another. Well, now, for years, you had Joseph S. Nye come around, uh, and he was the speaker at the Board of Governors right. meeting. I remember seeing him a few times. Joe was on our panel last year. Ah, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and he talked about soft power and right. smart power and all those things, right. which seem to be uh, forgotten in this administration, right. I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're a little bit self-inflicted wounds on our soft power here in the last uh, year or so, and hopefully we're going to get a little better on that and become yeah. a little more aware. Yeah. So, um, you know, part of this conversation on Wednesday night is, of course, Richard Armitage. Right. Can you talk about exactly who he is, where he comes from? Yes, we know he's frank, he's direct, and he's, he's really a, a high thinker, but he's also a very candid human being. Yeah, he was, uh, he was he's, he's probably the Republican that Democrats love, just like <laughs> Joe Nye is the Democrat that Republicans love. <laughs> we good. tried to bring one of each uh, to co-chair our our board, but Rich was Colin Powell's deputy at State Department. He'd been Assistant Secretary of Defense previous to that, uh, during, I guess, the Reagan and George H.W. Bush years. Uh, a great strategic thinker. Uh, he's uh, admired deeply in Japan. He's been considered uh, one of the key members of the Chrysanthemum Club, if you All would, right, yeah. uh, on uh, understanding and, and dealing with Japan. Uh, who argued many years ago, the question is not getting China right, it's getting Asia right. And if we get Asia right, then we'll get China right. And to get Asia right, you've got to get U.S.-Japan right. Yes. Uh, so that's been you know, his, his main thesis. And Joe Nye had developed the, the concept of soft power, which is the attractiveness of your ideals and everything else. And then Joe teamed up with Rich to come up with smart power, which is take your hard power and your soft power and use them smartly. Uh, and that's what uh, they've been pushing, uh, and some administrations do that better than others. <laughs> and some don't do it at all. And some it like, uh, uh, <laughs> have sort of missed that boat. So, you know, every year that uh, I've seen uh, uh, Richard um, Armitage come around, he's, he's sort of done a geography, if yeah. you will, of, of all the hot spots in the world, all the interesting diplomatic um, issues, controversies yeah. that are happening. And I assume, Ralph, that he's going to be doing that this year. What, what do you plan? Yeah, well, the plan this year, we're sort of, last year we changed the format. We did a conversation, okay. and I had Joe Nye and Harry Harris, Mr. Hard Power, Mr. Soft Power, oh, yes, and I yes, did a yes, Q&A yes. session with him. I was there. Them. I saw that. And yeah. we're going to try the same thing with Rich this year. We will just sort of, rather than have him give a canned speech, because the good part is the Q&A session. So we're going to go right into the Q&A session and, and just sort of press him on a couple of uh, couple issues yeah. and, uh, and try to get his candid thoughts. Well, can you give us a handle on some of those issues you might ask him about, Ralph? Well, obviously, you know, China friend or foe is, is a, big, uh, a big issue. And last year I asked uh, Joe Nye and Harry Harris that, uh, and uh, Harry was, was great. He said, I think China is a great friend of the United States. I also believe in the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny. Uh, and then he laid out from a military perspective the challenges that we have in China. And Joe talked more about the diplomacy and the fact that uh, we're still, you know, we're still the 1,600 pound gorilla, even if China happens to be the 800 pound gorilla. So, you know, tried to put it all into perspective. So we'll try to tease out Rich's view on, on that. I imagine it'll be a little bit of both. I'm sure it's forthcoming. Yeah. You know, there's one thing that happened in the paper I saw this morning, that the, the, the president now is increasing um, the sanctions on China, various yeah. things, very dr dr drastic, right. if not uh, yeah. you know, too drastic uh, sanctions. Yeah. Where does that play? I mean, you, can you be friendly with the same country you're imposing big sanctions on? Well, I, I, it's a challenge, but in some cases you have to be. I mean, the reality is China has been cheating for years, uh, and you know they now essentially force people to give their intellectual property rights in order to do business in China. Uh, it's certainly not a level playing field. We take their goods, they insist on tariffs on our goods. So a little quid pro quo in that area, I think, is a, is a good thing. 
Uh, I thought it was a big mistake when the president was tying the economic relationship to assistance with North Korea because the Chinese are either going to help us or not help us with North Korea based their on their own, own interest. national interests. Yes. So you don't reward someone for pursuing their own national interests. Uh, and when you start mixing economics and, and security together, uh, it becomes a bad mix. Uh, but I think getting tougher with China is long overdue. The question is, how do you do it and, and keep it under control so you, you don't up, end up with each one shooting themselves and each other in the foot? Well, Xi Jinping is a smart guy. We should talk a little about him. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Donald Trump, um, who seems to be managing everything himself, yeah. you know, re regardless of who is or isn't the Secretary of State at any given moment, um, he's not 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 as Akamai about yeah. uh, diplomatic relate about China. Um, and you know, if you put the two of them in a room, I'm afraid I would guess that Xi Jinping would have him for lunch. Isn't that happening? Uh, well, it's it's hard to say. Uh, I, I think the president comes in with his own biases and his own strengths and weaknesses, and so does Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, he's very internally focused right now. Uh, I think he's a master tactician. Uh, he's certainly very good at consolidating power. Uh, but there have been some strategic things that he's done that I think have been big mistakes. So I. I'm, he, I don't think he's any Deng Xiaoping. I don't think he yeah. has that kind of vision that some of the earlier Chinese leaders had. Uh, but how they interact together is, is normally pretty well controlled. Uh, I'm a little more nervous, quite frankly, about the, the Kim Jong-un Trump meeting, uh, because that uh, there is a little bit less control and a lot more unknowns. Mm. Well, back, back to uh, uh, Xi Jinping for one sure. moment, though. Do you, do you consider the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative that he has created over the past year or two um, to be a, a good move or a possible mistake? Uh, I think it's a smart move, uh, but it depends on how it plays out. Uh, what I've, I've talked to people in countries where the Chinese have started investing, and the question I get is, how do we keep getting Chinese money without getting all these damn Chinese? Uh, because when the Chinese invest somewhere, they, you know, they don't just build a building, they bring 500 workers yeah. to build that building, and then two of them, 200 of them stay. Yeah, it's and, always a quid pro quo. And suddenly you've got yeah. all these Chinese running little businesses and pushing local folks out. So there's, uh, uh, I, I think it could backfire on them in some ways. I mean, everybody wants Chinese money. We want Chinese money. but. You got to be careful about the strings attached, and, yeah. and that uh, could come back and, and haunt them in the long run. You think the world, and I mean the whole world, yeah. is Akamai about um, you know his his plan in that regard to sort of take advantage of one belt, one road. I think they're becoming smarter. Uh, I think that uh, there was a lot of uh, romanticism even within China. You know, five years ago, people were telling me, "Oh, Xi Jinping's going to be the greatest thing. We're going to really open up. We're going to move forward." And now they're all looking over their shoulder because while he's tried to, to push economic progress, uh, political freedoms have really gotten clamped down on, freedom of speech. Uh, people who used to you know, be very open in their comments about the government now are looking over their shoulders good whenever reason. they talk. With very good reason. And, you know, and a lot of people have ended up in, in jail in China for the sole reason of being on the wrong side of, uh, of Xi. So, uh, I think there's some, you know, there's some real problems there that uh, they're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Well, I mean, do you think this uh, undermines the authority, undermines the the power that he is consolidating, undermines his presidency for life that he's being that he's do, trying to do mind control on the average citizen? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a problem. You know, you have to ask yourself why does he feel like he needs to be president for life? You know, Deng Xiaoping said, you know, we I'll do two terms and then I'm going to sit back. I'll help from from the sidelines, but you know, we're going to keep the process going. Uh, so you can say, well, Xi Jinping is so strong and so secure that he can take over, or you can say he's so insecure and so worried about looking over his shoulder that he doesn't trust anyone else. Remember, Putin was president for eight years in Russia and then let Medvedev have it for four years while he controlled things as prime minister. Yeah. Then he came back. He yeah. didn't change the constitution. Yeah. She feels the need to change the constitution to stay there. He doesn't have a Medvedev. He doesn't have anyone he can trust enough. So that tells me that you know the man may be a little paranoid. And, 
And the future you know, the may old, be uncertain. That's right. China. The, the yeah. great Kissinger saying about, you know, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean there aren't people out to get me. <laughs> and uh, uh, there probably are some people out to get them. <laughs> Especially in diplomatic relations. Right. We take a short break. Ralph Cosa, Pacific Forum. We'll be right back and we'll talk some more about some of the PACnet writings that you have uh, published over the past uh, few months right. and examine your view of the world from that point of view. Thanks. Terrific. We'll be right back. Good. Aloha kako. I am Andrea, I am from Italy, and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there, right now, using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m., only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're here on a, on a given Friday in the, in, the, in the quiet of a Friday afternoon with Ralph Cosa. We're talking about his program, Pacific Forum program, uh, on March 21st, next Wednesday, um, at the Sheraton in Waikiki. Right. If somebody wanted to come or know more about it, where would they look, Ralph? Uh, www.pacforum.org. This should and not be a surprise. That's right. That should not be a surprise. And, and you'll get all the info you need uh, on the dinner. Or just call us up. We're in the phone book, but 521-6745. Yeah. Uh, we're happy to accommodate you. Well, it's a, it's a great event. And it's the money really... all goes for a good cause, helping uh, to get the next generation of young people involved in foreign policy. Let's talk about that. It's so sure. important. You know, my, my friend uh, Shackley Federal, retired judge, he's into the um, the... Uh, moot court competition uh, in, in China, and uh, it's about international law. Yeah. And uh, China apparently has uh, a need. Xi Jinping would like to have yeah. the law students and all these 50 law schools know more about international law. After all, uh, he took a bad hit in the Hague decision over the South yeah. China Seas and all that. Yeah. Um, so maybe he's trying to get more Akamai about how you argue those cases, how you appreciate and maybe change international law and so it becomes more important for the young people and the lawyers in China to know about that. I think yeah. he's right about that. But same here, don't you think? Our young people have to know more about international law and relations, no? Uh, absolutely. I mean, what we're trying to do is raise people's awareness. We understand not everyone's going to go into the State Department. They couldn't fit there if, uh, if we wanted them. But uh, there's everything relates to everything else. Uh, and what happens in the rest of the world has an impact on business here, it has an impact on security here. Uh, you know, when when the tweet comes in that says this is not a drill, if you had known that the North Koreans were in the process of talking with the South and that things had calmed down, maybe you'd have been a little bit less nervous and figured this must be a mistake uh, as opposed to uh, heading for a manhole cover. Yeah, we all should have called you that morning, Ralph. Right. Right. You would have told us. I was actually in Switzerland on a plane, but my wife handled it extremely well. She said, this can't be true because there's no sirens. Right. And my husband said, there's a less than 1% chance that right. this so will happen. Okay. So I'm not going to be nervous. Well, we have, we have a whole need for that. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we have to have our younger generation step up to. And in Hawaii, it's a perfect place to, to center that. Because we are the crossroads, we or yeah. we can be anyway, the crossroads of Pacific. And Pacific Forum is really part of that crossroads. Yeah. And we should have our young people go to Asia, look around, embed themselves for a while, spend some time in China if they can, and Japan and yeah. Korea and all that, and learn and take it back and make this more of a Switzerland of, of the Pacific, don't right. you think? No, absolutely. We, we have a, a program called APPLE. I can't even tell you what it stands for, but every year we take 10 of the best and brightest here in Hawaii in the 20 to 25, 30 age group, and we start bringing them in a couple times a month to sit in and sit in, in foreign policy lectures, come to our breakfast lecture series, uh, and bring them to an international conference in the course of the year, uh, just to get them more involved in what's happening. And right now, we have three fellows from Myanmar uh, at, in residence at Pacific what's Forum. A fellow? Uh, a young researcher who's in working on a specific research project 
three months to as long as a year, depending on their project and our funding. Uh, and uh, like I say, we've got three from me. This and is core to your mission to have these two, people come two over from and South Korea, and one write from articles. the Philippines, and and they're here, you know, doing research on different security-related topics, and we're trying to help them. And then we take them to meetings around the world, bring young South Koreans to meet with North Koreans when we meet with them. Oh, uh, it's uh, it's a great opportunity. So, can we talk about some of the articles they've been writing, some of the research they've been doing? Sure. In your PACnets, which are published yeah. what, every few weeks? Our, our PACnets come out once or twice a week. Uh, Not and, often. And they're free. Just again, www.pacforum.org. Say, uh -huh. put me on PACnet. We're happy to, to do it. We just published one yesterday in honor of our late founder, Joe Vasey, that he wrote that last year when he was only 100 years old, so he was <laughs> still a youngster. And, and uh, it talks about a grand bargain with the North Koreans. Uh, but we've had, you know, this young fellow from Myanmar who's talked about the need for another democratic party in Myanmar to challenge Aung San Suu Kyi and, and move things forward. A uh, young Filipino who's looking at South China Sea issues and is a little bit concerned about where his own government has been going in, in that. And young Americans, of course, who, who have come in and, and tried to think through issues. We've had a young American who just wrote a book comparing Myanmar and North Korea and how oh, Myanmar opened up and the North Koreans didn't. So, interesting. Uh, you know, bright, bright young guys. It makes you feel pretty confident about the future. And they get to know each other. So it's more than just coming yeah. here and doing research and writing. Uh, it's a kind of diplomacy all, all of its own because when That's they go right. back, they'll always yeah. be in touch. They'll be in touch with Pacific Forum. They'll be in touch with their, their comrades at Pacific yeah. Forum. Yeah, in addition to our in-house fellowships, we have Young Leaders Program, where we bring young people from around the globe to our various conferences. We have over 1,000 young people now from 60 different countries who have been to at least one of our meetings. And there's alumni chapters in Singapore and Beijing and Tokyo and Seoul and Washington. And these kids are interacting with each other. So 20 years from now, if there's a you know, a crisis somewhere, uh, the guy in the foreign ministry in Korea can pick up the phone with the guy in the foreign ministry in China or Japan and say, hey, remember me, we were young leaders together yes. and we need to talk about and this. And that could and, save lives. And that could, and, and that's, you know, that's what we're striving for. Yeah, so it reminds me of APCSS, doesn't it? And yeah, to they, I mean, they're, they're doing that with uh, more senior military folks and yeah. we're trying to do it with the next generation. But the idea is the same, it's to create links, create, uh, interaction among people, uh, because at the end of the day, people cause problems and people can solve problems. So, And diplomacy and international relations is all about people and personalities absolutely. and relationships. Absolutely. So you can have a completely irrational relationship that would lead to a bad place. Yeah. You can have a close relationship that could lead to a good place. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about Korea for a minute. Sure. Um, what do you think is going to happen here? Is this going to be a real meeting or a phony? Ah, boy, that's a good question, Jay. I mean, I, I think the one thing that, that Trump and Kim Jong-un have in common is that each one thinks he can outsmart the other. Uh, so history will find out which one is right. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, we have, to, we have to put it in perspective. Presidents, leaders don't negotiate. They set the parameter. Uh, in most cases, you have the foreign ministries negotiate, they reach a deal, then the presidents come in, shake hands, and sign it. In North Korea, if you don't get the president to agree in the first place, the rest of it is meaningless. And it's turning out in the United States, if you don't get the president to agree, you know, we've, we've seen too many examples of the former secretary of state yeah. Yeah. being undercut by the president after he said something. Yeah. So I think in, in this particular case, you almost have to have the two presidents, uh, the two leaders, Kim Jong-un is chairman or whatever his title is, uh, the, these two guys saying, okay, here are the basic parameters. This is what we agree to in principle. And then you get the experts to sit down and work out the details. So it could actually turn out to be good. Knock wood. Uh, knock on, yeah, knock you on know, wood. Something and, you said made me think that praying. the world is different now. This, yeah. this particular meeting somehow makes the world different. Before it was um, orchestrated by a number of people, a lot of yeah. input and all this. Now it's personal, and this two and they could get into the same kind of name calling, couldn't they? Uh, it's it's, they it's a risk, you know. I mean, it, diplomacy is always personal. At, at the end of the day, I, I, I recall, you know, every every four years or every eight years, we have meetings with the Japanese and the Koreans, and they are always nervous about the next president. Uh, and a very seasoned diplomat once said. 
whoever is president of the United States, his new best friend will be the prime minister of Japan uh, because you don't have any option. And sure enough, Abe and Trump are like that, you know, and, and if Hillary had won, they would have been like that. Yeah. And if someone else wins in Japan, they'll be like that yeah, yeah. because your national interests sort of force, force that on you. Uh, but if you have bad karma between the two or bad dynamics, and we had that uh, for a while between George W. Bush and Noam Yoo Hyun and in Korea, it makes it a little more difficult. They both pretended to like one another, but there wasn't that you know, deep element of trust. And that, uh, that's important. But at the end of the day, you have to rely on your professionals to do the negotiating. And, and we've got a great set of professionals in the United States in our State Department and National Security Council. Really? Short-handed, but you know, we make it sound like, oh my God, there's no ambassador in Korea, we're doomed. Well. Mark Knapper is in Korea. He's our DCM. He's a he's a acting charge, acting ambassador now. The guy has had 30 years of experience working on Korea. So it's not like there's no one there when you pick up the phone. You've got a very seasoned diplomat who knows what's going on, who's picking up the phone. Now, normally you would like to have an ambassador who can speak for the president. Uh, I don't want to be the guy that says I'm speaking for Donald Trump today because <laughs> not very attractive. You may find out that you're, you're not tomorrow. Yeah, have and, the rug and, pulled out from under and, you. Yeah, and that's uh, that, that's one of the challenges which I think makes working in this administration particularly hard. Uh, I think we're. Uh, I joke that there's a steep learning curve, and there have been more curves than learning, uh, and you know we're trying to get to the get to the point where uh, everyone understands things, and it's it's tough. You study diplomacy, you participate, you take trips and talk to diplomats, yeah. talk to experts in hither and yon, and yeah. you are sort of swimming in that milieu all the time, um, getting very Akamai about yeah. it. And so you can appreciate more than most, I think, the, yeah. the changes that are taking place in the world. And uh, you'll agree with me that Donald Trump has not been very good on diplomatic relations. He has offended our allies on a regular basis, just as he has offended people in Washington. Yeah. Um, and the question I put to you, this is not easy, this question. Yeah. I think it's not easy. Yeah. Maybe it's easy for yeah. you. As you know, he's offended people in Asia. He's done unreliable things. I went to Australia recently, and the general consensus was, we are so sorry for you Americans. Yeah. Yeah. You go to Europe, and they're all... We get, we get a lot of sympathy him. cards. Yeah. So we've been damaged. Yeah. We've been damaged in the past year. Yeah. My question to you, Ralph, is how hard or easy will it be to to correct that damage, to repair the damage that this administration has created in international yeah. relations? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a key question, uh, Jay, and it's one that probably can't be answered, but I, I will tell you this. Uh, after Trump's visit to Japan and Korea, his popularity rating shot up in both places. His speech in Korea at the National Assembly, his toast at the state dinner were magnificent. Uh, they reassured people. Uh, People were worried about whether the U.S. remained committed to the two alliances. After the Trump visit, they came away from that feeling very good about America. Still worry about how Trump is going to deal with North Korea and whether or not he's going to start a war or something. I don't worry about that, but there are a lot of people that do. Uh, but uh, in that case, uh, his, his visits there and his visits to the Philippines and to Vietnam were actually quite good. Uh, they were much better than I had uh, expected, oh, uh, certainly better than I had feared, uh, and, and he did a pretty good job. Uh, the reality is when the president sticks to a script, when he's speaking from staff work, uh, things work pretty well. Here's what I tell people, and it's not comforting to me, but I think it helps to understand. Every president in my lifetime has understood one simple fact. Presidents are not allowed to have a personal opinion. Mr. Trump doesn't accept that. So he gets on his tweet in the morning and he says, bad, sad, et cetera, this, that, and the other thing. These are not policy statements. They may become policy, they may not become policy. But we are so accustomed to believing that everything the word, every word that the president says is thought through and is a policy statement that we're not reacting the way we should. So they asked John Kelly, the chief of staff, how do you respond to tweets? And Kelly's response was, we don't. We do staff work. Uh, we don't pay attention to tweets. You know, the president says he wants this, or that. we do our staff work and we bring him uh, a paper. You gotta just not pay attention to him. 
wow, is that easier said than done? Uh, and certainly it's news when he says all of these things. Uh, but we have to distinguish between the personal opinion of someone who is not allowing the fact that he's president of the United States stop him from saying what he thinks, even if this doesn't necessarily percolate into U.S. foreign policy. It's, a, it's, an, it's an adjustment period. And it's uh, not both clear sides. exactly and how it ain't over. going to affect things. Either. That's right. It, it ain't over. One last point is uh, you are stepping down at some point soon as the, uh, as the chief executive right. of Pacific Forum. Can you talk about the, the change that reflects? Yeah, well, I've, I've been there for 25 years now, first as executive director and then as president. Uh, I plan on staying on as the Honda chair. Uh, Dr. Honda Haruhisa from Japan has been kind enough to uh, give us some money for a chair to let me sort of hang around and uh, continue uh, thinking and writing uh, while not having to run the day-to-day -day business. So we'll bring in someone. We've got some really good candidates. Uh, we're looking at them right now. And hopefully by August, uh, just in time for my 75th birthday, I will be able to uh, step back a little bit, travel something less than 220 days a year, which oh is what God. I've been averaging, yeah. <laughs> and uh, let let's someone else share the fun. Well, maybe, just maybe you can come around once in a while and tell us about your travels, your adventures, your writing. And sure, uh, I'll, I'll be lonely looking for someone to talk to, Jay, <laughs> so I'll be happy to come in. We'll do that. Great. Thank you, Ralph Cosa. My, my pleasure, Jay. Thank Excellent. you. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.